Support for KQED Live comes from Berkeley Rep and the San Francisco Symphony. Let's go on a color trip at the Asian Art Museum and see Yoshida Hodaka's modern prints. Born into an artistic family, Yoshida Hodaka defied tradition by forging his own style and creating fantastic landscapes. He found inspiration in travel, photography, and astrology. Color Trip Yoshida Hodaka's Modern Prints, now on view. Tickets at AsianArt.org. The disproportionate impact of More COVID. Than half of black business owners. And disproportionate. Somehow we always find a way Welcome to rise. To the blueprint builders, to the backbones of every block, for the curators of the culture, and for generations to follow. You might fall, but never fail. Keep rising. Keep rising. Keep rising. Apply for business, marketing, and tech makeovers on us. Good evening. My name is Olivia Allen Price, and I'm the senior editor and host of Bay Curious, and welcome to KQED Live. If you are joining us for the first time, KQED Live is our multi-platform events program that produces screenings, talks, food tastings, and performances like this one, all based on KQED's mission to inform, inspire, and involve. Now, you can keep tabs on what's coming up on the KQED Live slate at kqed.org slash live. Lots of fun stuff coming up. And if you're not able to make an event in person, here's a pro tip. You can always tune in on the live stream. Most of KQED events are streamed live on YouTube, the KQED Live YouTube channel. Um, we actually have about 400 people watching virtually tonight. So welcome to you also in the ether. <laughs> um, Let's see. Now, all of this is possible because of our KQED Live season sponsors. They are the Asian Art Museum, Berkeley Rep, Comcast Business, and SF Symphony. Bay Curious is also sponsored by Sierra Nevada, and we have been for a very long time. So we are very thankful for the support of all of these sponsors. Now, we are here tonight to listen to a story that has loomed large in California's history, the story of the Donner Party. It's a tale that gets told a lot in our modern culture, usually in a couple different ways. It's either the punchline for a joke about cannibalism, I will spare you mine, or it's a ghoulish tale, a story told to frighten listeners gathered around a campfire. Now, I'll admit, when we were first starting to think about how we would bring the Donner Party story to the Bay Curious podcast, I was in it for the spooky. I wanted to get into all the taboo topics that the story entails. But as reporter Carly Severn started digging and finding these morsels of truth that at least I had never heard before, the story really transformed. A quick note about Carly, who is going to be the main presenter this evening. She is an editor in the KQED newsroom, but she also talk, takes on some of the more macabre stories in California history for Bay Curious. Tonight, I invite you to wipe your memories, wipe your minds of everything you think you know about the Donner Party and try to hear Carly's presentation with fresh ears. And with that, let's get started. Please enjoy Endless Winter, the story of the Donner Party. Hey, wasn't it around here that the Donner Party got snowbound? I think that was farther west in the Sierras. What was the Donner Party? They were a party of settlers in covered wagon times. They got snowbound one winter in the mountains. They had to resort to cannibalism in order to stay alive. Each other, huh? They had to, in order to survive. Jack, don't worry, Mom. I know all about cannibalism. I saw it on TV. See? It's okay. You saw it on the television. When it 
comes to the Donner Party, the truth about the Donner Party, even the very notion of the truth is really complicated. Over the many years since it all happened, the story's been reduced in the popular imagination to its broad strokes. After all, in that clip we just saw from The Shining, as Jack Nicholson drives his family through the Colorado Rockies, <laughs> Wendy doesn't even know what state the Donner Party disaster took place in. There is no one definitive Donner Party history. What we know about what happened up in the Sierra is, in huge part, based on the very different things that survivors said or what they didn't say. But if you'd lived through some of the very worst things that a human body can endure, can you say with all certainty that you tell the world everything, just as it happened? Much of the journalism we have from this time is sensationalized. It is often downright unreliable. And since the 19th century itself, historians have brought their own takes. They've disputed different accounts. They've seen some survivors as more trustworthy than others, and they've imprinted their own biases and the social mores of the time. In the Donner Party nonfiction complex, writers today continue to do so, including myself. <laughs> right here. So let's start with what we do know for sure, who the Donner Party was. 177 years ago, in spring 1846, these people left the Midwest and walked to California. You can see them here in silhouette. Women, men, lots of children. Almost 90 people. 177 years ago is not that long ago. Those of us here tonight are only a few generations, really, removed from the people of the Donner Party. The Donner Party wasn't just one family called Donner. It was a blended bunch of multiple families and many hired hands, all bound together on a journey of over 1,000 miles west. Like thousands of other settlers in this year, they were traveling in one long, snaking party of wagons and livestock along the Oregon Trail, and then cutting south on the road to California, through the grasslands of Illinois, across the desert, and then finally crossing the Sierra Nevada mountains into California. There was a Donner family, that's them up at the top, two brothers, Jacob and Donner, Jacob and George Donner, and their wives, Tamsin and Elizabeth, and this couple's many children, 12 kids between them, you can see there. You might have also heard this called the Donner Reed Party, that's because there was a Reed family. James and Margaret Reed, pictured here, plus their four children. On top of them, you had the Breen family, Patrick, and another Margaret, Margaret Breen, and their multiple children. Alongside them, the Keysburg family, the Fosdicks, the Murphys, the Graves clan, and that included 20-year-old Mary Graves. These people did not all know each other. They'd all either set out together or wound up teaming up on the road. If they were all in this room, sat now with us, almost half of this room would be Donner Party. And you'll also see some of these people are marked differently here. I'll explain that in a moment. Now, we want to set the scene a little in time and space. James Polk is the president. In 1846, the Civil War is still 20 years away. Slavery is legal in many states. The members of the Donner Party, especially the landowners, especially the businessmen, enjoy a freedom of movement and self-determination that is not afforded to everyone living in the United States at this time. And I mention this because throughout tonight, I really want us to keep thinking about that pioneer mythology that's been used to sell the American West for almost 200 years now. This is what you imagine, right? These, these people here. The legend of hard scrabble, plucky folks, almost always white, risking life and limb to make the journey overland for a better life, setting up home in some wild, empty wilderness and beating the odds to make it. The imagining of those exact people 
stands over 20 feet high on the site of the Donner Party disaster. But the majority of the Donner Party weren't the hard scrabble travelers of the pioneer legend. They were not poor. Poor people, by and large, could not afford to make this journey west at this time. The majority of these families on the trail had money and they had land already. And most of them just wanted a little more of it. The Donner Party did have those hired hands, their teamsters, you can see on the bottom there. They were being paid to accompany the richer folks of the party, but even they too were buying into pioneer mythology at the very start, that California was wild, empty land for the taking. After all, this had been the men wanted ad that George Donner himself placed in the Springfield, Illinois Gazette. Westward ho! Who wants to go to California without costing them anything? As many as eight young men of good character who can drive an ox team will be accommodated. Come, boys. You can have as much land as you want without costing you anything. This was the era of manifest destiny, the belief that settlers didn't just have the right to expand west from sea to shining sea. It was their duty, their God-given birthright. But this wasn't empty land. Before European colonization, California was home to hundreds of thousands of indigenous residents. The wider Bay Area alone was home to many long-standing tribes with incredibly diverse cultures and languages, from the Washoe tribe of the area around Lake Tahoe to the Ohlone in what is now San Francisco. Communities living life, working, starting families, caring for the land. And California was not actually part of the United States then. In 1846, this was legally Mexican territory, and Mexico was actually in a war with the US for this territory. There were other things that might have motivated a member of the Donner Party to make this massive journey. Not gold, that is still two years away still, but the threat of diseases out east like cholera and malaria, better economic prospects, but for many of them, they saw relocation to California as one big real estate opportunity. And now we know all this, let's begin the journey. wonder if there were already a lot of folks making this journey west that same year, what made the Donner Party different? The answer, they were the only travelers on the trail in spring 1846 who decided as a group not to follow the trusted path into California with all of those other people, but to take a chance on a new route. And that is the route highlighted in white up there. By 1846, Migration West had become an industry, and as we see every day in America, any industry attracts its grifters. One of these was a guy called Lansford Hastings. He'd written this guide to making the journey into California that told travelers of a cutoff. He sold it as a shortcut that would take them weeks, save them weeks, and as much as 400 miles. The problem was, this route was a total scam. It was based on guesswork. Hastings' guide only really recommended it because it would divert travelers into places where he and his cronies had money-making schemes set up to profit off of them. The so-called Hastings cutoff actually added a whole month to the Donner Party's journey, forcing them to hack their path for their wagons through treacherous mountains like this. Then they had to cross the Great Salt Lake Desert, which was twice as long as Hastings had told them it was, 80 miles in total. Now, you'll notice that some of those Donner Party folks up there are shaded differently. That is the handful of people that died even before the Donner Party reached the Sierra, some from natural causes and accidents, 
and a few in more nefarious circumstances. I'm not going to dwell too long on how the journey went so wrong so fast. The most important thing you need to know is that at this part of the journey, they are, in many ways, already doomed. That terrible guide that Hastings wrote had gotten one thing right. In order not to cross the Sierra Nevada in the snow, any travelers needed to leave the Midwest at the right time, as Hastings himself wrote. Unless you pass over the mountains early in the fall, you are very liable to be detained by impassable mountains of snow until the next spring, or perhaps forever. By the time the Donner Party left, they were already three weeks late. They should have been able to turn to look behind them on the trail and see a snaking line of people just like them making this journey west with their wagons. The Donner Party should have seen that, but instead they turn around and they see nothing. They are the very last wagons on the trail in 1846. So way before the Sierra, their fate is sealed. I want us to now fast forward to the part after the Great Salt Lake Desert where they are getting closer to California, but they have run out of food. And they have lost one of their leaders, too. You see the B over the man in the Reed family up there? That is B for banished, because James Reed, who was a sort of joint CEO of the Donner Party along with George Donner, was excommunicated from the wagon train and forced to leave without his family. That's because Reed had killed another man in the party in a kind of 19th century road rage incident over the wagons, although, of course, he claimed self-defense. Things are so desperate that two more men leave the party to ride ahead and get help. They have been sent on a mission to get food and to bring it back to all those people in the desert. These men drag themselves to a place called Sutter's Fort in what is now Sacramento. This was a giant ranch and trading post presided over by a man named John Sutter, a Swiss man who'd truly gotten in on the ground floor in early efforts to colonize California, and he prospered hugely from it. Sutter's Fort was his empire in miniature. But this place ran in large part on forced labor. Sutter had claimed the land of the Miwok and Nisenan people who called this region home, and then courted them to work at his fort. And then when he met those who wouldn't, he forced them brutally into what a visiting settler called a complete state of slavery. But because Sutter liked to flex his power to white visitors, when those two men from the Donner Party reach Sutter's fort, he gives them those life-saving supplies to take back to the rest of the party in the desert. And Sutter also sends two young Miwok men from the fort with them to help take the supplies back to the Donner Party and help guide them. The recorded names of those two Miwok men are Luis and Salvador. At least those are the names given to them when they were converted to Catholicism by the Spanish missionaries. We don't know much about Luis and Salvador, including whether they labored by choice at Sutter's Fort. Their story often gets lost in the Donner Party saga or straight up left out. And this is the part of the saga that brings us to the base of the Sierra. The rescue party with Luis and Salvador have found the Donner Party in the desert. They've given them those life-saving supplies. They have all rejoined the right path, the Overland Trail, into California. It's October. It is colder here. And they can finally see the granite cliffs of the Sierra Nevada. All they need to do is make that final push across the pass. 81 people, including their saviors, Luis and Salvador. They are exhausted. They are hungry. They are edging their way from Reno to present-day Truckee. But they are going way too slowly. And this is when the snow starts to fall. Oh. 
You might have been in a place like Tahoe when bad weather hits, but the snowstorms most of us have seen in our lives are nothing compared to what the Donner Party experienced in October 1846, as they attempted to reach the Donner Pass over 7,000 feet above sea level. They thought they were on the final leg before freedom. Instead, these 81 people found themselves attacked by a shockingly early snowstorm that kept piling high, snow as high as 15 feet deep on the ground around them. It was snow that literally covered them where they stood, and this snow would just not stop. It lasted for days. The Donna passed through the Sierra, the way out had become completely impassable. With snow this unfathomably deep, there was no pass anymore. So when the party realized they could not go any further, they made camp right by what's now called Donner Lake. But a quarter of them, including the Donner family themselves, were actually stuck miles behind at a place called Alder Creek. And this is just one of the many ironies of this disaster, that no one called Donner even made it as far as the places that bear their name today. None of them could move forward, and they couldn't move back either. So, the Donner Party start desperately constructing shelter from the elements. Some had the strength to fashion rough cabins, but in the unbelievable conditions, others managed nothing more than lean-to tents made of sticks and animal skin. There was actually already a cabin built there at the lake, a very recent relic of a previous party that had passed through these mountains just one year earlier. An 18-year-old named Moses Schallenberger had built it and lived there completely alone for three months when he was too weak to join the rest of his crew. And lucky Moses had made it out alive, he was rescued. And now his tiny cabin had become the shelter of the Breen family, who called dibs on it. A little further down the trail, the Murphy family built their cabin against the side of this large rock. That rock, by the way, now holds a bronze plaque with all the names of the Donner Party on it. The other families built their cabins and their shelters startlingly far apart. After six months of chaos and violence on the trail west, the Donner Party were sick of the sight of each other. And this is incidentally something I thought a great deal about during the height of the pandemic, how, <laughs> how tempting narratives of solidarity and collective strength are, and in the very worst of times, how inaccurate they turn out to be. Already running dangerously low on provisions, the travelers trapped in the snow kill the last of their oxen for food. First, they're eating the meat from the bones, but when the meat is all gone, then they have to scrape what they can from the animal's skins, what's called the hides. And when there's nothing edible left on those, they're then boiling up those leathery skins and scraping off the gluey mixture that results and then eating that disgusting mixture. And when that gluey residue is all gone, all that's left is to start chewing on the hides themselves. Imagine it, you are in this beautiful place, it beautiful when the snow finally stops and you can see it. And you can see all around you with this expanse of water, Donna Lake just stretching out in front of you. And behind that water, there's the peaks of the Donna summit, but you cannot leave. The snow around you is too deep to even move in. In some parts, it is taller than a one-story house. And this is where I also want to talk about the cold. I have been cold before, you have, you've been cold before, but not like this. The average December low in Truckee today is 15 degrees Fahrenheit. For context, inside of your average refrigerator, the temperature is 37 degrees. At higher elevations and during storms, this would have actually been even colder than that 15-degree low for the Donner Party. They were not equipped for even just passing through this kind of cold, let alone living in it, for weeks that turned into months. Their cabins were more like 
shacks. They'd been on the road for six months already. Their clothes were thin and threadbare, and no match for a Sierra winter they were never meant to be caught in. One thing I'd always assumed is that a person could get used to the cold, that if it was your reality every single day, you'd somehow stop feeling the, the bitter chill on your hands and on your feet and on your face. But that just isn't true. The body can acclimate to extreme cold. It can adjust to preserve its core heat, but that doesn't stop you feeling it. The numbness in your fingers and in your toes doesn't fully take sensation away unless those extremities are, are dying. You feel it all, all the time, especially when your body is starving and it's been stripped of its insulating fat as your stomach gnaws and cramps with hunger every day and your head and your eyeballs throb and pound every day from the glare of the sun on the bright white snow. When the body goes into a state of starvation, it slowly transforms and the, it begins to consume itself because it's pillaging its own reserves just to keep you barely alive. Just listen to how the science writer Sharman Apt Russell puts it, and you can begin to imagine what was starting to happen to the Donner Party. Prolonged hunger carves the body into what researchers call the asthenic build. The face grows thin with pronounced cheekbones. Atrophied facial muscles account for the mask of famine, a seemingly unemotional, apathetic stare. The clavicle looks sharp as a blade. Ribs are prominent. The shoulder blades move like wings. The vertebral column is a line of knobs. The legs like sticks. A true battle for survival has begun for the Donner Party. And all around them, as the days turn into weeks, the freezing snow just keeps coming. And all they can do is sit and shiver in their dark, lonely cabins and watch it pile up. This is when the patriarch of the Breen family, Patrick Breen, starts to keep a diary. He's scratching the words into a small sheaf of folded paper. And I really cannot emphasize enough how extraordinary a document this diary is. It's now in the vault at the UC Berkeley Library. And it's the only first-person account of the Donner Party disaster written at the time that's seen the light of day. Snowing fast. Snow higher than the shanty must be 13 feet deep. Don't know how to get wood this morning. It's dreadful to look at. Provisions getting very scant, people getting weak, living on short allowance of hides. Today is February 23rd, 2023. Patrick kept his diary most days. And this is his diary entry for February 23rd, 1847, scratched into his small book 176 years ago today. And to prepare you for this, you should know that Towser was the name of the Breen family dog. Froze hard last night. Today, fine and thaw, he has the appearance of spring, all but the deep snow, winds south to southeast. Shot Towser today and dressed as flesh. Mrs. Graves came here this morning to borrow meat, dog or ox. They think I have meat to spare, but I know to the contrary. They have plenty of hides. I live principally on the same. Inside their makeshift cabins where families are huddling to escape the elements, it was dark and increasingly fetid, especially when people started to die and those squalid cabins started to become tombs. Can you imagine the smell of those cabins? Everything is wet, never warm enough inside for anything to truly dry. Dead animals like the Breen's dog, Towser rotting hides. The camps are filled with children of all ages, enduring one of the most traumatic events imaginable. The youngest child in the Donner family was called Eliza Donner, and she was only three at the time. That's Eliza there on the right with one of her sisters, little Georgia Donner. They survived like so many of the children did. Their families were prioritizing them. 
Many others, primarily the single, poorer men who were accompanying the party basically as their servants, were not so lucky. And even though Eliza Donner had been so tiny at the time, decades later she wrote a memoir documenting those dark days at Donner Lake. And of course, it is hard to know what Eliza really might have remembered being so young and what she had just heard from others who were there. But her descriptions of the terrible isolation up there in the Sierra are unforgettable in just how sad they can be. Oh, it was painfully quiet some days in those great mountains and lonesome upon the snow. The pines had a whispering homesick murmur and we children had lost all inclination to play. Life at the lake was hellish, but six miles back at Alder Creek, where the Donner family had gotten stuck with Eliza, things are unimaginably somehow even worse. This is Alder Creek today. Back then, in the winter of 1846 to 1847, there were no cabins built here for these families to live inside. There were only lean-tos, the flimsiest of tents. George Donner himself is increasingly immobilized from an injury he'd sustained back before they reached the Sierra. He'd been repairing the wheel of the family's wagon with a sharp tool, a chisel, and he slipped while doing it and sliced open the back of his hand very deep. And it had got infected. And in the 1840s, even if you got medical attention, this was the kind of injury that you would look at and your family would look at and know exactly what it could mean. Even in good health, this situation is desperate and there is truly no food. A month and a half passes here at Donner Lake. It's mid-December, 1846. The party has made repeated, desperate attempts to get out and through the mountain pass and over the summit you can see here. Each time the snow is just too deep, the trail just too obscured. But it is becoming clear that if anyone is going to survive, someone needs to push through and go and get help. So, the party at the lake identifies the strongest people among them. These 17 people make rudimentary snowshoes so that they don't sink and disappear into the deep snow. They strap them onto their feet and they say goodbye to their families. Then, they hike away high onto the peaks above Donner Lake to try to finally cross the mountains. This is the escape party known as the Forlorn Hope. And it includes Luis and Salvador, the two Miwok men that John Sutter offered up to the Donner Party. Sutter had delivered them into this ordeal. This was not their journey, not their quest. By bringing that food to the desert, they saved the Donner Party, the very people who had already journeyed a thousand miles to claim their land in California for their own. And now they were trapped with them in a landscape the Miwok knew was inhospitable during the winter. They knew this was not a place for the living. But if things at the camps were bad, things out there, fully exposed to the elements, are about to get so much worse very quickly for the forlorn Hope Snowshoe Party because it's here, not down at the lake, when the cannibalism begins. This small party battles ahead in the face of howling storms. They desperately press on with bleeding and tattered feet. They are virtually blinded by the glare of the snow. First, one man dies, then a second, 
And because it's way too far to turn back for the relative safety of the camps, for the first time, these famished, freezing snowshoers start to talk about the possibility of sustaining themselves on the flesh of the dead. How do you first start a thing like this? How do you look it in the face? The very first historian to write about the Donna Party just 30 years after the disaster was a truckie newspaper man called Charles Fayette McGlashan. And in 1879, this is how McGlashan wrote about that day. As the flakes fell thick and fast, the party sat down in the snow, utterly discouraged and heartsick. There, in the deep, pitiless snow, surrounded on all sides by desolate wastes of snow, the idea was first advanced that life might be sustained if someone were to perish. Since leaving the cabins, they had at no time allowed themselves more than one ounce of meat per meal. And for two entire days, they had not tasted food. The terrible pangs of hunger must be speedily allayed or death was inevitable. All they need is a final nudge. And that comes when a third man, Patrick Dolan, dies on the snowshoe trail. Patrick's last hours had been truly agonizing, freezing cold and entering hypothermia. He'd suffered what experts call paradoxical undressing, when you are so cold that you actually start to feel boiling hot. That is the body at once releasing all of the heat it's been storing close to your core and flooding your limbs with unbearable warmth. This had made Patrick suddenly tear off his clothes and race into the forest, raving and screaming. And when he came back, it was only a few hours before he dropped dead. In some accounts from survivors, it was actually Patrick who had first suggested the snowshoe party take the ultimate step and start eating their dead. So maybe that's why it was Patrick's death that finally made them take their knives and make that leap. And as that first historian McGlashan relates, they did what they knew they had to do. The men finally mustered up courage to approach the dead. With averted eyes and trembling hands, pieces of flesh were severed from the inanimate forms and laid upon the coals. It was the very refinement of torture to taste such food. Yet those who tasted lived. After Patrick, the snowshoe was turned to the bodies of their other dead, and then the bodies of those who died in the days after. And once the snowshoe party begins to eat their dead, they can not stop. But here is the thing. You'll often hear people say that as horrible as the cannibalism of the Donna Party was, at least they only ate the flesh of folks who'd already died, and they never killed anyone for food. But unfortunately, that is almost certainly not true. When the Snowshoe Party started to eat their dead, all the accounts agree that Luis and Salvador were the only ones to refuse even though they themselves were also dying of hunger. They would not break the taboo. And because of that, they had become incredibly weak on the ground. And seeing their strength waning, that's when one of the men in the Donner Party, a man named William Foster, took his gun and murdered Luis and Salvador so that the rest of the party could eat their bodies and keep themselves alive. In the 90s, a historian called Joseph King used records at Mission San Jose where he believed Luis and Salvador might have been converted. From this, he believes that Salvador may have been a Miwok of the Kusumne tribelet, whose birth name was Yu Yun, and that he'd have been around 28 when he was murdered. King believed that Luis might have been an Oknehamne Miwok with the birth name Eimo, and that he was just 19 when he was killed for food. After three weeks on the mountain, the survivors of the snowshoe party had the strength to finally stagger into the valley below. 
strength they had gained from killing the man who several months ago had come to save them in the desert. It is warmer here. It is sunny. It is January 17th, 1847. It's a new year. And the first people the snowshoe party saw, the ones who first helped these half-dead survivors, were Miwok people. They had stumbled into their village looking like emaciated demons. After weeks of blizzards and howling gales, their clothes were literally hanging off their bodies in ribbons. And these Miwok families had no idea that the party they were now giving food and shelter to had murdered and eaten two of their own people just days before. And none of this is some secret knowledge, by the way. It's not hidden in the record. This information has been out there for many, many years in plain sight. And it is a testament to how we think of the Donner Party and the story that it tells about the birth of California, that the story of Luis and Salvador and what was done to them is never front and center. This is when the Donna Party saga shifts. It is now a rescue story. The snowshoe survivors make it from the village to Sutter's Fort, and from there, news of the disaster spreads like wildfire. The thing about rescues is they are expensive, especially in the 1840s, where you will have to pay people to travel into potentially lethal conditions on foot to rescue people they don't know. So John Sutter masterminds an open letter to be sent to San Francisco begging for aid, and it's read aloud in the dining room of one of the city's early hotels. We are still one year away from gold being discovered. San Francisco is not a big town yet. Some of those people sitting safe and warm in that hotel by that fireside, listening to that letter, had actually been on the emigrant trail with the Donner Party before the party took the fateful cutoff and you know what they must have been thinking. That could have been me. That could have been my family. So while San Francisco was digging into its pockets, remember James Reed, the guy who had stabbed and killed a man on the trail and been banished from the wagon party. His exile had saved his life. He'd made his way safely to California, knowing his wife and children were running out of food fast, and now he is fundraising for a rescue mission, too. Meanwhile, back at Sutter's Fort, a tiny ragtag rescue party is scrambled and sent up into the mountains first. But as they made their way towards the camps in February of 1847, through those deep, deep snows, 13 people up there had already died. Charles McGlashan, that very first historian of the Donner Party, of the 1870s was so relatively close to these events that he'd actually spoken with many of those who witnessed things firsthand, many survivors. And in his book, he urged the reader to imagine the scene that greeted those very first rescuers who arrived at Donner Lake. Let us glance ahead at the picture soon to be unfolded to their gaze. The midwinter snows had almost concealed the cabins. The inmates lived subterranean lives. Steps cut in the icy snow led up from the doorways to the surface. Deep despair had settled upon all hearts. The dead were lying all around, some even unburied, and nearly all with only a covering of snow. All were reduced to mere skeletons. The eyes were sunken deep in their sockets and had a fierce, ghastly, demonical look. Those first rescuers have no idea what is waiting for them at Donner Lake. And when they arrive first, all they initially see is smoke curling out of these holes in the white snow. And it is smoke from the, the fires that are burning in the cabins because the cabins are buried deep under the snow. And then 
a woman comes crawling out of one of these holes and she looks barely human. And these are the first new people she has laid eyes on in months. And the first thing she says to them is, are you men from California or do you come from heaven? But that first rescue party is just seven men. I can't help but wonder how the Donna party felt when they realized that. All those first rescuers can do is distribute a little food amongst the survivors, just a little, and then lead the ones who could walk out of the camps. This is, however, not some medevac to safety. This was the start of a days-long march over the mountains through snowdrifts as high as houses. In these desperate conditions and still lacking enough food, more of the Donna Party die on the way when they are so relatively close to freedom. But the people left at the camps don't know that. All they know is that they've watched these other people, they've been trapped here alongside for months, many of whom are family. They've watched them be led away from this hellhole. And so the ones who've been left behind just return despondent to their dark cabins. Little Eliza Donna was one of those left, and in her memoir she recalled the desperation for food, any food. The little field mice that had crept into camp were caught, then used to ease the pangs of hunger. Even the bark and twigs of pine were chewed in the vain effort to soothe the gnawings which made one cry for bread and meat. And then, here it comes. The camps can not hold out any longer. They are about to take that step that the snowshoe party, the forlorn hope, did high on the pass weeks back. A young man named Milford Elliot, known as Milt, had just died. He'd been one of James Reed's teamsters, and now he was just one of the dead bodies lying on the ground at Donner Lake. The name of that woman who had popped up through a hole in the snow when those first rescuers arrived was Levina Murphy. She is the Mrs. Murphy mentioned in this historic entry in the diary of Patrick Breen, where we finally see it. The first mention at the camps of cannibalism. Friday, February 26th, 1847. Mrs. Murphy said here yesterday that she thought she would commence on milk and eat him. Years later, in her memoir, Eliza Donna confirmed that the flesh of the dead was used to sustain the living at the camps. But Eliza said that that was not until the mothers had watched their children eat the very last of the food that the first rescue team had brought. She said that wolves had dug up the bodies of the Donna Party's dead that were buried beneath the snow. Perhaps God sent the wolves to show Mrs. Murphy and also Mrs. Graves where to get sustenance for their dependent little ones. Was it culpable or cannibalistic to seek and use the only life-saving means left them? There is no going back now. Back in the Midwest, these had been genteel, well-to-do people. They had money to smooth over some of the less palatable parts of life that other folks suffered unvarnished. But now, in a way, everyone is equal here at Donner Lake. Nobody has some secret supply of food. Nobody has the cheat codes to life here. You can promise people money later for helping you now, and indeed many of the richer folks in the party did try to do that, but the money itself, it's no good up here. If you want to live, you need to eat. And the only thing to eat is people those same people that you've been traveling with and talking with for months now, you know their names, and you know the names of their children. And now, because they are dead and you are not, you have to treat them like you would any other animal and, and cut them into pieces. 
It was two weeks from that fateful diary entry until a second rescue party arrived, led by none other than James Reed. He had finally raised the cash and found enough men in San Francisco to come get his family. And this time, 17 more people are evacuated, leaving only a few of the Donner party behind. This included most of the Donner family themselves at their camp miles back at Alder Creek, which had become a horrific site of bodies. Another two weeks later, a third rescue party arrived and evacuated the remaining Donner children, including Eliza. And this particular journey out of the mountains was harrowing in a way that it is hard to fathom. The group barely survived, becoming stuck in a blizzard of unbelievable magnitude right where Sugar Bowl Ski Resort is right now. And when they finally escaped it, half dead, Eliza recalls reaching the safety of the Sacramento Valley. There we caught the first breath of springtide, touched the warm, dry earth, and saw green fields far beyond the foot of that cold, cruel mountain range. Our rescuers exclaimed joyfully, thank God, we are at last out of the snow. Eliza had been in the Sierra for five months and only a handful of the Donner Party were now left behind at the camps. These were less people, more walking skeletons, kept barely alive on a diet made up almost exclusively of human flesh. They were the ones who'd either been too weak to travel or had refused to leave, like Eliza's own mother, Tamsin Donner, Tamsin had actually been visiting the lake camp when that third rescue party arrived. She'd walked the six miles from the Alder Creek camp, leaving her husband, George Donner, back there. His split and infected hand had progressed so badly up his arm that it had him on the verge of death, and Tamsin knew it. Her daughters were already at the lake camp, having gone ahead earlier. It would have been so easy for Tamsin to gather her daughters and follow the third rescue party away from the lake towards safety and warmth and food, but she didn't. Tamsin sent her children on ahead without her, even though that third rescue party told her it was very likely that no more rescuers were ever coming. And so, after watching her small children leave without her, getting smaller and smaller and then vanishing into the mountains above, Tamsin walked back alone to Alder Creek to her husband and waited to die with him. The very last rescuers who made it to Donner Lake in April 47 were really only making the journey for the salvage. And after Almost half a year of survival by more than 80 people. The landscape that greeted these last rescuers was one of total horror. Depending on who you believe, body parts, including heads, were scattered around in the snow. They found one last survivor at the lake, injured and completely alone up there. This was a man called Louis Kiesberg, whose wife and child had been brought out by the first rescue party two months before. This is what Kiesberg told that first Donner Party historian, Charles McGlashan, decades afterwards. For nearly two months, I was alone in that dismal cabin. No one knows what occurred but myself. Life was a burden. Five of my companions had died in my cabin, and their stark and ghastly bodies lay there day and night, seemingly gazing at me with their glazed and staring eyes. I was too weak to move them had I tried. To see that loathsome food ever before my eyes was almost too much for human endurance. But miles away, back at the Alder Creek camp, the rescuers only found the body of George Donner, whose infection had finally killed him. Everyone else, including Tamsin Donner, was nowhere to be found. And back at the lake, the rescuers couldn't help noticing that 
Louis Kiesberg was now holding a great deal of the Donner family's possessions and their money. Kiesberg is half dragged out of the camp along the same frozen path to freedom that his family had taken weeks before, but he didn't yet know that his little girl had died making the same journey. And so when Kiesberg stops to rest, because he is exhausted, he sees this little piece of cloth sticking up from the snow. And when he pulls on it, he exhumes the body of his daughter. And that is that. The last of the Donner Party, the last living member of the Donner Party, has been brought down from the mountains. And Donner Lake is silent once more. All that remains up there of this disaster are the bodies that are still lying on the ground. But slowly, spring creeps into the Sierra, and all of that snow starts to melt. And when it does, the horrible things that had stayed buried under feet of snow up here at Donner Lake begin to be revealed in full. Anyone passing by, and they do, now spring is here, can see just how degraded humans can become. This is not what the nascent California wants to be. So the solution for officials was a band of soldiers who were sent up to Donner Lake in the summer on a mission to take care of the mess. A writer called Edwin Bryant went with them, and what he later wrote about that day was stomach churning. Bryant and those soldiers were looking at what remained of the Donner Party. And according to Bryant, what was left, what the snow and wind and the hungry wildlife hadn't claimed, was the evidence of sheer desperation. Near the principal lake cabin, I saw two bodies entire, except the abdomens had been cut open and entrails exacted. Their flesh had been either wasted by famine or evaporated by exposure to dry atmosphere and presented the appearance of mummies. Strewn around the cabins were dislocated and broken skulls, in some instances sawed asunder with care for the purpose of extracting the brains. Human skeletons, in short, in every variety of mutilation. A more appalling spectacle I never witnessed. That military party scraped all the remains they could find up from the ground and dug a hole in the floor of one of the cabins. And then, says Bryant, they set fire to the whole thing. These soldiers weren't just performing a physical cleanup job. They were taking a truly shameful part of the state's history and erasing it from sight. The death toll, you can see here, had been huge. 81 people had entered the Sierra, and almost half of them had died up there. As the Donner Party dead were being burned up at Donner Lake, their family members who'd made it out alive were safe and warm, miles away to the west. And many spent the aftermath actually recuperating at Sutter's Fort. But like many people who suddenly find themselves at the center of terrible events, the Donner Party survivors found other people were already writing their story for them. The California Star newspaper published an account it claimed was based on eyewitness testimony from the last band of rescuers. And what was in it set the stage for the demonization of the Donner Party. It casts them as terrifying ghouls, so hooked on the taste of humans that they'd been somehow transformed by it into cannibalistic monsters. A more shocking scene cannot be imagined. A woman sat by the side of the body of her dead husband, cutting out his tongue. The heart she had already taken out, broiled and eaten. So changed had the immigrants become that when the rescuing party arrived with food, some of them cast it aside and seemed to prefer the putrid human flesh that still remained. 
A lot of what was published in the California Star was undoubtedly sensationalized or just flat out wrong. But this story, published hot on the heels of the disaster, set the tone for how California looked at the Donner Party, and it haunted the survivors for years. Eliza Donner had lost both her parents and many more of her family in those mountains. She'd just been a small child at the time, and still her memoirs dwell on how people came up to her in the street and quoted that newspaper story and told her how much she and her family had degraded themselves in the Sierra. And meanwhile, Louis Kiesberg, the last survivor to be rescued, had become a marked man. Because Eliza's own mother, Tamsin, had been alive when the previous rescue group had left her, the rumors began that Kiesberg hadn't just stolen her money up there. They said he'd murdered and eaten her, and that he'd boasted about making soup from human bones. None of this has ever been proven. Yet all the while, an actual killer within the Donner Party received quite different treatment. When the Snowshoe Party, the Forlorn Hope, had made a break for freedom, William Foster had murdered those two young Miwok men, Luis and Salvador, for food. This was no secret, but Foster never faced a true reckoning for his crime. It ultimately wasn't seen as a crime. Foster had even joined the rescue party to voluntarily return to Donner Lake and bring more people to safety. To the increasingly white world in California, Foster was a hero, not a murderer. And condemning what he did would have meant condemning a mindset and a way of life that had greatly benefited many people who came to California to claim it for their own. In January 1848, just nine months after Kiesberg was dragged off the mountain, gold was discovered in California. Those small flakes in a river changed California forever. And most of all, for those who had lived here for centuries, white migration into California had been just a trickle. Now it became a flood. Earlier colonizers from the Spanish onward had already hugely disrupted the lives of California's indigenous residents. But it's believed that in just those first 20 years after gold was discovered, up to 80% of California's indigenous population was wiped out, not just by disease, but by destruction and murder. And those who survived found themselves displaced and their customs, cultures, and very lives irrevocably altered, all by design. California had a new self-image, a new way of being, and everything that came before that that didn't fit that self-image was treated like dirt in the gold pan, discarded in the name of progress. So it's ironic that in many ways the Donner Party themselves were treated that way too, because their drive to acquire that zeal to stretch out, to grab just a little bit more and turn your face away from just how deadly the cost could be. For many, it's not just setting the table for the gold rush. It's a whole country in a nutshell. Even as California bloomed under the gold rush, virtually all of the survivors of the Donner Party quietly and deliberately retreated from view. That silence up at Donna Lake, they had brought it back with them. And many of them would keep that silence inside of themselves for the rest of their lives. Among so many families in the Donna Party that entered those mountains, just two had survived intact, the Reeds and the Breens. And after what happened, and what people can do in the very worst of situations, many of them never felt any desire to even speak to other survivors again. Once more, that collective solidarity you might have assumed, it wasn't there. Survivors like Mary Graves, they'd seen the newspapers, they knew how people thought of them. And the lack of compassion 
shown to the donor survivors at the time, I know can seem really startling to us, but perhaps a lot of folks back then just didn't have the kind of emotional vocabulary that we might employ now to think compassionately about trauma. And then there's just the sheer compelling grisliness of it all, a testament surely to the long time appeal of true crime. But maybe this new California, swollen with people and gold and self-regard, it also didn't want any reminder of early failures by some of its earliest settlers. Desperation and degradation, after all, hardly makes for a satisfying origin myth. Especially if a person couldn't quite say with certainty what they'd have done if it had happened to them. One last thing before you leave and go into the cold tonight. <laughs> that pioneer monument I showed you at the start is standing on the exact spot where that band of soldiers very likely dug their pit and burned the remaining bodies of the Donner Party, which means there is a very good chance that this tourist attraction where every visitor to Donner Lake now takes a smiling photo, um, is more likely a tomb hiding in plain sight. And I said at the start of this evening that the idea of the truth is a slippery thing when it comes to the Donner Party, and that history is also the stories we're told about the past, who's telling them, and who gets left out. But sometimes, it really is right in front of us. Thank you. For our music tonight, uh, Daniel Berkman playing the Aunt Martineau and the Mellotron. For our readings, thank you to Paul Lancourt. And I'd really like to thank the folks who are invaluable to our research for this, including those who originally contributed to the podcast version of this on Bay Curious. Special thanks go to Dalton Brown, Chairman Jesus Tarango, and former, chair former chairwoman Mary Tarango of the Wilton Rancheria Tribe in Elk Grove. Also, Greg Palmer at Donner Memorial State Park Museum and Dr. Christopher Colwell at UCSF. And Afifa Tawil, who originally sent Bay Curious the question that sparked this whole enterprise. At KQED, huge thanks to Lance Gardner, Sarah Rose Leonard, Ryan Davis at KQED Live. In the booth, Neil, Danny, Ron, Jim, Dennis, Ryan, thank you very much. Olivia Allen Price and Brendan Willard at Bay Curious, Victoria Maleon at the California Report Magazine. Our beautiful illustrations tonight were done by Anna Vignier. Lastly, thank you all for coming out on this cold night to spend some time with us in the Donna Party tonight. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>